And uh, I tweet underscore MD um, on Twitter if you want to follow my talk after this. Um, and this talk is my um, sharing with you guys my understanding of craftsmanship. This is something I came across uh, quite early after the craftsmanship movement starts. I actually was in one of the initial sessions in the London Craftsmanship with Justin Ray Initiative uh, a few years ago. And uh, to be honest with you, when I heard about craftsmanship in the context of software, I was very puzzled. Because for me, craftsmanship is something like art or you know some sort of handmade stuff that you're doing, and some Japanese Jews doing some very funky thing in some office in the backyard, and I didn't see the relationship straight away. How is that connected to software development? And what does it mean? What does craftsmanship mean? And uh, it was confusing to begin with. I didn't see the connection between those things. And, um, and I think my understanding has been evolving, and I'd like to share. And that's what this talk is, and that's what came to be my understanding on what is my evolving understanding of craftsmanship. And uh, it all started in 2008. There was a conference in Toronto where Robert Martin, everyone familiar with the name Uncle Bob? If you're not familiar, the uh, STEMS a conference is down the road here. Okay, so Robert T. Martin, he was talking at this conference here. And uh, he asked everyone to raise their hands if they were doing agile, if they were doing a TDD, and tap your hands up if you're doing TDD, if you're doing this, if you're doing that. And then by the end, there was very few hands up. And because he was going like stricter and stricter and stricter in, the, in his questions, he makes, he makes a point in his talk. He's talking about, oh, uh, it looks like Scrum and uh, extreme programming are coming closer together. Uh, because this conference, the Agile, the Fasana, you have both communities here. So in some ways, the communities are coming closer together. But in other ways, um, I see the extreme programming people are talking about strict things, very realistic things. And the Scrum people are talking, you know, that flip flop. Uh, uh, certifications uh, is just for the eye to see, so uh, both not actually relating to what actually people do in real life, something is missing. And then he, 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 he at the end of the conversation, at the end of his talk, he, he says that, you know, I think something is missing in, in the manifesto, so the agile manifesto in this case. And then he proposed a, five, a fifth uh, item for the manifesto. Uh, which is craftsmanship crack, which really doesn't fit the <laughs> doesn't really fit in the, in the agile manifesto. If you the, the word the key word in the manifesto is, is over, yeah. We value the things on on the left and with the thing the thing we also value the things on on the right. Uh, we value uh, individuals and interactions over process and tools. Which means we still value process and tools, there's some value in it, but we value individuals and interactions over that. This doesn't really fit that, because you don't value crap at all. Uh, so it's kind of a, trying to force in an idea in that. But he wanted to bring something and says, yes, we're missing something. We're missing getting things done in the right way. So he changed that. He moved crap away and added execution. Uh, but still didn't go to the manifesto, the manifesto still the manifesto that we know today. So he came up with another manifesto. There's another community come up, and the craftsmanship community, which is an evolution of the previous um, uh, manifesto. So you still have, you can't see this very well, can you? It's a bit dark, yeah. So, but this is the, the craftsmanship manifesto. Everyone familiar with that? Yeah? Okay, if you're not, it's just go, you can go manifesto.softwarecraftsmanship.org, you can see the manifesto there. And um, what he says is that we value not only working software, that's something that you have in the Agile Manifesto, we value working software. Not only that is enough, but well-crafted software. We have value well-crafted software over working software. Yeah? We value uh, responding to change, but 
stead steadily adding value over that. So stead steadfastness over just delivering something, being able to respond to things. And we value individuals and interactions, but we value a community of professionals over that. We value customer collaboration, and another thing, but we value productive partnerships over that. So it seems there's a lot to discuss on these things. And, and it really, I came across these four things, and I was like, yeah, that, that's a nice summary, but it can be seen in so many different ways. And what, what does it mean? And uh, this part of so much discussion in the community is so many blog posts came out. Uh, you know, the craftsmanship is, uh, is a movement for prima donnas. My code is better than yours. So clean and beautiful. Look at this. Your scrap. You have to learn how to write code properly. It's calm. And, you know, misunderstanding of what the, 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 craft, the craftsmanship was actually all about. In, in the beginning, there on the, on the paragraph, it says, as an aspiring software craftsman, we are raising the bar of professional software development by practicing it and helping others learn the craft. It's kind of serving with that. And through his work, we come to value it, and then you have that. Okay, so what this is, on top there you have well craft, steadfastness, community, and pr productive. So we're going to go over those four topics within the within the items of the manifesto, and then see if we can take out some assets of it, of it, okay? So this is the first one, not only working software, sorry, you can't read it very well, just perhaps if you could, can we turn the lights off on this part here, maybe? Then it would help, yeah? Let's see if you can improve a little bit. You never know if you're gonna get a dark room or a black room. <laughs> Someone is trying it. Okay, but this is the number one item of the manifesto. Not only working software, but well craft software, which, which obviously we need to talk about business. Yeah, let's talk about business. It makes a lot of sense. To talk about business. So there is a book called The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work by uh, Alan de Botton. So Alan de Botton is a philosopher. He writes books on philosophy, and he wrote this nice book on work. Not many people write books about work. If you go to a, a bookstore, look, you want to find a book about, uh, usually you find things about entertaining. Yeah, You don't want to read more about work. You are immersed in work on, a, on your daily basis. When you sit down to relax, you don't want to read about work. So you rarely find a book that talks about the nature of work. And I think it's quite interesting work. I, 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 I'm going to be referring to this book a couple times today. And what I, I don't think, thank you very much, what I don't think you're going to see so much in uh, Alan de Botton's approach is how does it apply to our community, to the community of software development. I think I, I would like to add up some ideas on it in the context of software uh, craftsmanship. But Alan, he went to a factory, a biscuits factory, and he asked a question to them. Um, why, why do you do what you do? They, this factory, United Biscuits, they had people working on that factory for 42 years in the same job, making biscuits. Now, you know, you know you're going to be born in this mature world, you're coming from your soul there and it happens, and you, you know, someone's telling you, what do you want to do when you go to work? You say, I want to make biscuits. 42 years. Would you say, would you ever <laughs> consider that? And then he was puzzled and he asked them, why? Why did you do that? And, and some people said, you know, I, I think about that person, 11 o'clock mid-morning, when he's going to have his cup of tea, that he's going to have a biscuit with his cup of tea. And this is the idea of they find meaning in what they do through <laughs> the value that they add to other people's life. So there's something about you know creating pleasure to people or diminishing their pain or making other people's lives better. And that's meaning. And he went to many, many places in the UK. The, the, the sense of meaning is something that happens um, very strongly in the, re the rationale of why you do what you do. You, you understand, like, if you're trying to find meaning in what you do. You're trying to find uh, 
reasons to do the work you do. But you find those reasons into serving others. We, I don't know why is it with humans, but we like helping others. We find happiness in helping others. And this is a, a part of meaning that is very nicely explained in his book. And I was thinking about craftsmanship. Because in craftsmanship, you have this idea uh, of meaning as well. But I don't think it's exclusive of just doing what is it that is meaningful for them. Uh, there is a strong sense of what, you know, delivering value. And what you do, you have, has to be built in software that you're building. You have to show empathy to, to, the, to the, the customer. You have to show empathy to the final user. You really have to understand the context in which the software is going to be used. But with the craftsman, there's something more there. There, there is a, a sense, a direct sense of enjoyment in the work you're doing itself, in the nature of what, or how you work, or how you approach code, which is beyond, is different than the final product that goes to the customer. Okay. So I. I was thinking about this, um, and I remember when I, uh, and when I did my first degree, I did my first degree in sociology, and I had a, a science, a political science teacher, and he was talking about Benson and utilitarianism, and he came, and he quoted the preface of Dorian Gray, which is amazing, which is the, 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 part, the last paragraph of the, the preface of the picture of Dorian Gray, says this, that we can forgive a man for making something useful as long as he's, he does not admire it. You can forgive him. If he does something useful, you can forgive him, as long as he doesn't admire it. <laughs> the only excuse for making a useless thing is that you admire it intensively. Isn't that messed up? All art is completely useless. So you don't do art because you, uh, you want to be useful. You do it because you can't help it. It needs to get out of your body. It's the poison that is inside of you. It has to come out. You need to express yourself. You need to get that out. Okay? And this is quite difficult for people who are not in aesthetics and not in arts to understand. I myself felt very puzzled by my uh, literature, literature teacher. Um, she, she was looking, she was staring at me. I had a, a black book and then I had a, a red a red pencil on top of my book, and she was, she was like man, dribbling, looking at it, and and, and, I, and I was kind of surprised. Why, why is she looking at my pencil? She was like, oh, the red pencil on the black book, oh, so beautiful. And I was like, what? <laughs> the, the, the aesthetics is something that makes no sense, but if we are attracted to beautiful things in different ways. We, it's something that you know appeals to us, you know, and and that is about that is another aspect of meaning. It's not the meaning which is externally motivated, it's meaning which is internally motivated, okay? And we do that when we, when we write code. We have this internal motivation, we have our passion for code, yeah? And then you can see very strong conversations about code. People can get very opinionated about code, <coughs> yeah? And not, if we, um, when we're having those conversations, sometimes we don't have in mind so much the final use of software, how the software is going to be used by the, by the user. We're talking about the name of a class. And we can take a, you know, we spend a good 40 minutes discussing whether we're going to call this a, a, a user or a customer. It doesn't really impact the, the final software, does it? And, and that is passion. That is something unique, I would say, about the, 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 this this profession, and maybe other professions as well, but it's beyond the sense of value. You with me? I you understand what I'm saying. Meaning is expressed in two dimensions: internally motivated and externally motivated. So another way, another another way I find is is, is in writers. They, they 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 have this this the same sense. This is a writer I like very much, Henry Miller. He says that when a, when a writer puts out his writing, it's like it's like poison inside of his veins. He has to take it out. He has to throw these poisons in a white pages to kind of uh, uh, get rid of false wave of light and be himself. Honesty. So it's like a, an impulse. You have to you have to take out of yourself. Another thing very beautiful that Henry Miller talks about that has some relationship with this is that uh, when he, he he goes to France and has a relationship with a French writer there, 
and his name, and he, he's saying, you know, I want to leave a scar in the world. His writing's like he wants to uh, carve a scar in the world. And we're very much like that. We don't, we don't just want to write any code. We want to write code that makes a difference, and we want to feel uh, proud of what we're doing. Yeah? So that's an internal, intrinsic motivation here. And if you don't have that passion, and Khalil Gibran says, and you know, if you don't love what you do, you know, just stop doing it all together. Just sit in front of the church and beg for money. Doesn't matter what you do, you know. Stop doing what you're doing. Just sit, sit there anywhere and just beg alms. So this is passion, and I think this is this is what code statics is all about. It's 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 it's, it's not just it's not just value. It's not just a, how the code is going to impact the final product and how important it is to maintain. Uh, your your application and sustainable pace. It is also about a sense of passion, a sense of aesthetics, and there's actually a niche literature a book just talk, talking about that. That sense of how good code and should look like. So I so in summary, craftsmanship gives meaning beyond value. It gives meaning. It's, it it gives a sense of profession. It gives a sense of pride. It gives a sense that you can find in craftsmanship in other in other arts as well. A man who makes gates would be very particular about the way he makes the gates. He's a craftsman, and he loves what he does. Yeah, as opposed to uh, a tradesman. So let, let's look at the other aspect of the thing. So one thing is uh, the intrinsic motivation, and the, the dichotomy between value and passion. And another thing is that we cannot ignore is the final product. And what you're producing with your software is something that has to last. Yeah, sustainable base. The second principle of the manifest says that we we're not only looking into being able to respond to change, but we also want to do it steadily, and we want to keep adding value steadily. So that's about sustainable base. That's about steadfastness. That's about long-term life of the software. You want to be able to to um, to do it for a long time. So the aesthetics is not enough. Um, so picture yourself, you go into a hairdresser, okay? And the, and the hairdresser, you, you, um, it's a craftsman hairdresser. So, you, know, you have no say on how you're gonna cut your hair. I decide I'm gonna cut your hair. I know my craft, shut up. This is your hair style now. And I decide here, you have no saying. In, in, would you like to go to a, to a hairdresser like that? You go in and you come up with a hair like that? I would say no. I said that he's, he's probably. <laughs> you <wouldn't> mind. <laughs> so it, it's something out of, out of balance here. You, I, I go, you, go, <laughs> you go to buy something, and, and the person we selling the product is telling you how the product is going to be built. So it's got to be. This is out of balance, isn't it? This, there's something here that's not right. Not right. And uh, very early on, after the the, the craftsmanship buzzing started going around, I, uh, I don't know if he wrote this. Uh, this is from 2011. Uh, he said that the, there's a risk in software craftsmanship that you're going to become. This is going to become about romantics with big egos. And uh, and he, he was comparing programming with a trade. He says programming is not a craft. Programming is a trade. People come in with a problem, and you have to solve that problem. And just shut up and solve the problem. Deliver the value. Yeah. So that's that's a dichotomy, isn't it? It seems like they are in contradiction. Trade, in, trade and craft. Seems like it's not the same thing. Would you? Do you have to, to do you have to trade every single time when you build this software? Is that an element of craft? Where is craft important? Where is trading important? Of course, we know from um, uh, from if you are. Let me just ask you: Are you developing software for yourselves? If you develop software, if your company develops software for your own company, can you raise your hands? Okay, and you develop software for other companies? Can you raise your hands? Okay, so it's kind of half half. So, if you imagine, if you imagine that um, a customer comes in 
and say, I, I have this problem, solve it for me, and it can be an internal customer or an external contact like a customer. And um, the, the, the customer will impose, um, we, we impose what you're gonna say, we need, we need this to be done in this date, and it needs to solve this problem. But very often, especially if you are in the industry of supply software to other organizations, there will come in that some technical stakeholder from their organization that is going to come in and be opinionated about the way they develop your code as well. And very often companies have to put their tails in between their legs and follow that, otherwise they're going to lose their customer. And that, that falls into the trading, falls into the trading uh, world. And the, the craft world is where uh, they, they, the, the customers are completely disillusioned with the existing code base and they're now begging for quality. Yeah? Been there? And everything is burning and it's in, okay, we surrender, do whatever way you, you want to do it, but leave, uh, release us from that mess. And that's where the, perhaps the craftsman has more of a saying than the tradesman. You with me? Uncle Bob says there's no way to go fast uh, unless you go well. Yeah? The only way to go fast is, the, is going well. And we, we understand what this, that means. Uh, but you can't impose that into your customer. We have to go do well. And, and then the customer says, no, I want it to go fast. <laughs> but no, you have to go fast, you have to go well. And there is that, that kind of um, uh, crushing, crushing of, uh, of egos and, 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 and disagreements. And someone wrote a blog post about that, and uh, and, and Uncle Bob he replied to that. So he said, "Okay, uh, I think you're talking about two things here. You're talking about the, the, the craftsman and the laborer. He divides them into two. He says the craftsman understands sustainable base and takes responsibility for that, and the laborer just actually do what is asked of him to do. And we need both. In capitalism, we also also have these two forces. We have the, the new intern guy that you can juggle around and say, hey, do this report for me, and you do that spreadsheet for me, and the, the, the intern will do that. And you also have those brilliant interns, the brilliant people who come out of the university, who you can just feed a little bit of ideas, and now you develop this program, and they will come up, and they will be authentic, and they will be creative, and they will come up with their own contribution. So capitalism, you, you require both. You require some people that you can just deliver, delegate stuff to. They, you know they're going to do exactly what you asked. And you have those other people who you, you can just give them an idea and a goal and they'll come up with something complete and they're going to take ownership for it. So both exist in capitalism and both exist in code. Um, Constantine here, my colleague and myself, we gave a talk, uh, was it last year? I think it was last year. No? So two years ago? I think it was last year. Yeah, no. And we talked about how um, TDD, and well, we're actually talking about a, a larger context than TDD, and actually works better for long term relationships. You, if you want to, I mean, we're talking about sustainable pace. If you want to build something fast and get out of the way, if you do like little trades, that means that you don't want to be engaged with that customers for very long. You have little, many customers, you just do a little bit like a hairdresser style. They come in and they come out. You just want to do what they ask and they're out of the, <laughs> out of the way. But if you, have, if you want a long-term relationship with the customer and you're delivering something that you know is not going to last, you're going to deteriorate your relationship very, very quickly. You're going to be on time in the first project. And after that, you're going to have to maintain business as usual, support, and everything is going to fall apart. And then the relationship will fall apart as well. So without the element of craftsmanship, you can't actually have long-term relationship with the customer because that's when things are going to fall through the cracks. Yeah? But there is a role for tradesmen as well. Some companies are like small um, design agency or maybe bigger uh, companies as well that will take on work and don't care about long-standing relationship, just want to get the money and get their software out of the way. And the, the market is, is fit for both. So both things exist. And just to, what is important to understand is the consequence of operating in one mentality or in another mentality. But both exist. And the, the, the fast thinkers, the, the, the traders, or the people who want results very quickly, they'll say, you know, just make it work. Later, we're going to make it right. Yeah, you heard that one before? Yes? And you never make it right, never have the time to make it right. Or when you go back to make it right, it's too late, and it's just too much mess, and everything's 
fall through the crack. So that, that really doesn't work in the long term, does it? So what really works uh, is when you try to make it work, you make it work in a way that you can make it right in the future. And that's a different mindset than make it work and make it right. Yes? You have to consider how can this evolve. You have to have that, at least you can have that approach to, to, to the thinking process. And that changes a lot because you know that when you're writing software, you're writing for the long term. And you're considering how can these pieces come together in a way that allows for evolution. Okay, so that's very central to steadfastness. Which, which you know, takes me to the, the third one. This is the, the third um, <laughs> of the manifesto, the third statement of the manifesto, uh, which is not only individuals and interactions, but a community of individuals, a community of professionals. Okay, so going back to that uh, um, Lennon's blog post, he says, uh, what I don't want, however, is a prima donna plumber who insists on talking about the elegance, the beauty of the art of plumbing, who insists that I appreciate the aesthetic beauties of his journey. I'm going to put a tube here made of gold because it's really shiny and beautiful, and it's going to cost you another 300 pounds, uh, but I'm very sure that this is very necessary. And what you really want is that you don't want the tube to look beautiful, you just want the water to flow into, into your, your system. So that he was very concerned that you know, the prima donnas and romantic the big eagles uh, would, 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 be, would be the case uh, of that craftsmanship aura. Okay? So I think, I think this, this, this misunderstanding has been clarified over and over again. This is about uh, actually coming from a place of humility and humbleness. It's, it's a place of, of actually serving. I, I, see, I see craftsmanship as a service. I see that uh, you want to help other people learn and develop their passion through software in a way that will actually build better software on the long term because you know the consequence of building things with that fastness in mind will result in software that will stay on for, for longer. But we need to take care of ourselves first. You know, it's very quick to jump in and point the fingers to the bad code you see on the web and oh, look at this, it's horrible. I made, a, I made a, a New Year's resolution two years ago that I would not uh, make any comments about any, uh, anyone else code. And I can do now because it was my resolution 2014. So. No, but I, I, I try to stay away of kind of uh, criticizing other people's code in a, in a, in a negative way. Um, criticism is really important, uh, as, but it's important that you create a, an environment of uh, pulling feedback instead of pushing feedback. But most and foremost, we have to try and put our mask first before helping others with theirs. We have to know where we are in our, in our progress. We have to know how good we are. We have to understand principles well before imposing them on other people. There's so much, so much don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, without actually understanding the context where things apply. You know? Just staying away from saying, this is wrong. Stay away from that. No, this is wrong, this is not the way. There may be a better way, the old way may be even better than the other person's way, but you know, that's always a, a better way of, of phrasing things than saying uh, this is wrong and this is not the way to go about doing something right. And you, you can do that if you have developed confidence in a way that you're doing things. So first put your, uh, your mask before helping others do that. And, and, and uh, that's, the, that's the idea. It, the craftsmanship is not about elitism, it's not about I am sitting on a golden tower and I know everything now because I'm a craftsman. I'm not just a programmer, I'm a craftsman. So I'm there in the golden tower, I'm made of gold, I'm almost a demigod, and you're a crap because you're not a craftsman. That is completely wrong. You, you don't have the right man mindset. It says, it says here, uh, as far as software craftsmen, uh, we are here to practicing, practicing first and foremost, and helping others learn the craft. There's a service movement. That craftsman is a serving uh, software developer who is very passionate about what he does 
and who wants to help others get there. A beautiful word is company. Company means two things. It doesn't only mean organization, it also means to be in someone else's company. But I like, I like that word very much in that in essence. Because it's uh, we always we always with someone when developing software. Developing software is about interactions with people, you build software for people, people who is gonna order the software, it is it's gonna be maintained by other people, and the element of company and feedback is constant. So if you can understand how how you can impact others through craftsmanship, through principles, through a code, a code of conduct, a code of uh, proceeding with uh, looking at the code in a way that, that, that will make the code better for maintainability, then you can help others. But it's important to understand that becoming better at something, mastering anything, is not something that happens overnight. It's not just, you know, don't do that and do that. It's, it's a cognitive journey. It's something that you need to lead people through. And to, to actually, to become really good at helping others, you need to understand that this is, this is, is a process, and people will flow through stages, and there's something that's appropriate in certain stages, and something that's not appropriate in certain stages. And I think that's my understanding of the third principle, that you have to move on and help others understanding where you are and understanding where they are. I see, I see our journey very, very, uh, in a very clear way. We go through three stages when you learn anything. First, you want to become familiar with things. You want, you know, when you when you put into a new situation, first thing is the familiarity. What is this? What we're we talking about here? You just want to, to know uh, how to get things done. Yeah, when you're learning anything new, you want to know how to get thing, things done. And then, if you are here, uh, just say you, you you have this team and um, that you're managing, and then none of them have ever done TDD before. And you tell them you've got to do this project with TDD from day one. They're gonna panic. They're gonna start doing TDD as soon as they as soon as they start failing. What's gonna happen? They're gonna fall back into their old ways, and they're gonna feel really bad about themselves. Yeah? Have you experienced that before? Any of you? No. In one hand. <laughs> so I see that a lot. I move from company to company. I see people like imposing <laughs> imposing good practices on other people. And they're not, they're not confident that they can perform. They're just, you know, they're just being introduced to things and just they fail, yeah? So people need to become confident of anything to be able to perform. And uh, confidence comes with enabling. You have to be there and you have to break, uh, be available to break the obstacles, yeah? And that takes time. And once they're confident of performing, then, you know, they, they, they will evolve their, their own practice, they will start having uh, inspiration from their experiences and that takes them to the intuition level where they become more, uh, they can use context, they can use the practice depending on the context, they can adapt the practice to each, each, each context, okay? So it's a journey. It's important that we know where we are and we respect where the others are and then help them through the journey. So that's, I think that's an important concept in, in, in a community. And your company, you should see your company as a community. You should see the people who you work with as a community. If you are an open source uh, person, you see your, your, your community as your company. Com in a sense, they are accompanying you in this journey. And a community of professionals, it, it's, it's a community and it's, it's, a, it's a company. A company with each other should have feedback with each other. And that has, has to be a respectful feedback and uh, a serving, a serving uh, mood. Okay. The last one is uh, not only customer collaboration, but productive partnerships. Okay. Beyond collaboration, uh, partnerships. So if you remember uh, the, 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 this paper from 1986, the new new product development, yes? Did it? There's some people. Okay. So this is the first time the word Scrum come in the context of software development. So, um, Hirotaka and Ikujiro, they, they wrote this paper and they're describing that there's something changing in, 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 in the world, in the way that we produce things, and that you know the old style re re relay race, I've done my beats, now it's up to you, doesn't work anymore. Yeah? It used to work from 1970s, uh, we had this um, method called the waterfall, I finished my beats, now you do your stuff and the other people do that stuff afterwards. That worked really well for a while, but now we need to uh, 
diminish the feedback loop uh, very much because things change very quickly. Yeah, we are, we're seeing the industry where things changes from week to week and we need to be working very close together. And he, the analogy here is a scrum, you know, the scrum formation in rugby. Everyone comes close together and move as a team. So we need to work in collaboration to have um, responsive and productive partnerships. So that's the idea of uh, the rugby approach, the scrum approach. So the old style customer provider, it's not something that is so much compatible these days. And uh, you, you have a customer who imposes you what to do and come with a list of requirements. That is still the case because of culture. That's, that has been the way for many, many years. So your customers are gonna come with you with a wish list and that's the normal default approach. But it requires with the craftsman and has a responsibility of educating what is the most suitable way of engaging so we can move towards a partnership with, the, with our customers. That doesn't happen automatically. You can't impose that. Your customer comes to you and say, uh, sorry, you're not gonna be my customer. We're gonna be partners now. <laughs> they're, not, they're probably not gonna accept that. <laughs> you, should, you should understand, you should build software in a way that invites partnership. And that is focus your relationship uh, with the customers based on goals rather than uh, a list of requirements. Even though they're going to come to you with a list of requirements, you sit down and have a conversation. Oh, that sounds like an interesting list of requirements. Very good. You've done your homework. I understand that you understand your product very well. Can we now look into the reasons why you want to do this? Can, what, what is it that you want to achieve? And then having that conversation with, with the customer. There are many techniques you can do. This is one. Impact mapping to center your conversation with whoever you're engaging with around project goals rather than requirements. That allows you, that gives you the flexibility of actually moving forward in a way that is beyond uh, just mere collaboration. It's, it is actually, it is like it is your product. It's completely empty. So that is very, very good what you're saying, but. Uh, that is not just the development organization and the customer organization, is there? You have, in one hand you're the developer and then you have a customer here, and then it would be so easy if it was only like the developer going to the customer and say, yes, I'm gonna do that for you. But we, we have those people in the middle who sell the project, <laughs> who <laughs> comes to you and say, oh, I made this arrangement with this customer, he wants all of these and it has to be done by this date and go and do your agile, I don't care, but it has to be done by this date, all these requirements, and, and good luck. Yes? <laughs> Everyone here. Yeah, so it, the delivery and the engagement have to be in sync for things to work, and, and that's what I understand from, from this uh, principle. They must be in sync. Your, 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 the people who, who sell the engagement, the people who create the engagements with their customer, and the people who is delivering, they have to be in sync. And that means the organization has to change, the vocabulary has to change, and they have to talk the same language. Uh, and when they change, when they, they do talk the same language, then you can say the organization has changed to protect the partnerships. Okay? Everyone has to be in the same line. So, to get there, you have to make the decision that that's the way you're going to deliver. And that has to be a delivered decision. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't, it's not gonna happen automatically. Just because these developers guys are doing this agile thing and doing this craftsmanship, doesn't mean that the sales people are gonna sell that way. You know, the organization together has to make a deliberate decision. We are going to deliver uh, software which is for long-term relationships. We, uh, we, want to, we want to promote craftsmanship. And that has to be an organizational decision. You know, the people who are in the sales team, the people who are in the marketing team, they all have to talk the same language. It has to be an organizational change. It has to be led through uh, those principles. Okay? Otherwise, it's not going to happen. If you, the, 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 the developers are doing the, the craftsmanship and, and the, 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 the deadlines are soaring and the, people, the sales people make promises that are, not, are incompatible, that is not going to work. Okay? So productive partnerships means that it's partnership with the customer, but it's also partnership with the entire organization to be able to um, affect and change. So in what, what we talked about, we said, we, we explore craftsmanship in regards to uh, 
well-crafted software being springing from meaning, and in meaning that transcends value, meaning that comes from intrinsic, intrinsic motivation. And we explore uh, how craftsmanship would be suitable for long-term relationships, and how that changes the relationship in the long term with, with your, your customers and within your organization. We also talked about how uh, we are uh, not a community of elitists, but instead, this is a, a serving and a learning community. And there's a community that uh, helps with learning and helps with serving, and the elitist behavior is actually contrary to the craftsmanship uh, principles. And a craftsmanship has to be deliberate. It has to be a deliberate decision accepted by every level of the organization for it to be effective. Okay? And I think my intrinsic motivation comes from this man. He once told me that uh, it, I didn't have much relationship with him. He is my father. I met him when I was like 18 or something. And then he told me this. He said, you know, whatever you do, just do the best you can. And that's, you know, I, I stuck with that. <laughs> and that was good enough for me. And uh, I think this is the essence of craftsmanship. And I thank him for that. Um, I thank you for listening. Um, I work at Invic, I contributed with this back. My, my Twitter handle is underscribe D, if I stay in touch. And these are the people who I stole all the images that on the slides. Thank you very much. <laughs>